This is an Oliver 1650 tractor and it needs batteries. I'm not happy with the factory battery setup so we're going to make some changes. That's also going to give us a chance to try out this new toy, a hydraulic battery terminal crimper. Here we go. On these Oliver tractors the batteries mount underneath of the platform where your, where your feet would normally sit while you're driving and they sit inside these two battery trays. There's one on either side and the trays kind of tip up like this and then there's a couple of bolts here that hold the whole tray back against the, the bottom of the platform here. I've already removed the batteries obviously and I was just having a look at the battery cables so some of them look pretty good some of them look a little bit tired. This one I don't know it's like it may have had a new end crimped on it at one time so like I said same idea on the other side looks like both of these terminals have been replaced at some point in time and the cable itself eh, it's not looking the greatest here's the batteries I don't know how old they are the date code was never scratched off they're probably six to eight years old would be my guess these are six volt batteries hooked up in series to give you 12 volts these are group four batteries 950 cold cranking amps they're both shot I charged them up then I tested them with my carbon pile load tester here. They both failed miserably. We do not, however, need a load tester to tell us this battery is bad. You can see how badly kind of bubbled up the plastic case is here around the, the positive terminal. That's a classic sign that the battery has been frozen. So what happens is the, the acid inside the battery, as the battery discharges, it becomes more like water. And that water freezes. And, you know, when water freezes, it expands. And it bulges out the plastic case and it can separate the plates inside the battery giving you bad connection inside so typically when a battery has been frozen there's no bringing it back it's it's junk this is a schematic of how the batteries are hooked up in the tractor currently so it has two batteries six volt batteries hooked up in series and it essentially gives 12 volts to the starter now the catch is when you have two batteries in series, the, the amperage is going to stay the same. The voltage adds, but the amperage does not. So if you think about these two batteries as being one big battery, it's essentially a 12 volt battery with a 950 amp rating. And if you look at the power output, so power watts equals volts times amps, so 6 times 950 is 5700 watts. So the two batteries together are capable of producing 11,400 watts of electricity. Now the alternative here is two 12 volt batteries in parallel. So if you think about these two batteries as being one big battery, it would essentially be a 12 volt battery with a 1900 amp rating. So if you do the same kind of math here, you're going to find out that this 12 volts in parallel has twice as much power, 22,800 watts of power out of two 12 volt batteries. So, you know, what's the catch here? How can you have twice as much power out of two batteries that are basically the same size, you know, physical size as these two 6 volt batteries? Well, it has to do with the amount of time. It's what they call the reserve or the capacity what it basically means is that these two 6 volt batteries hooked up in series can produce 11,400 watts for twice as long as these two 12 volt batteries can produce 22,800 watts and it's not exactly the same because uh, there really isn't an equivalent 6 volt to 12 volt battery here but if you look at the reserve capacity of a group 4 6 volt battery it's probably going to be in the area of like 240 minutes. And if you look at the reserve capacity of a large 12 volt battery, let's say like a 65 group size or a 31 group size battery, it's probably going to be more like 140 or 150. So what that means is that these two 6 volt batteries, they put out less power, but they can do it for much longer. So essentially you get a, a longer cranking time. Now what I'm thinking about doing is converting this tractor over to two 12 volt batteries. Because the 12 volt batteries are easier to get, you have more selection. Uh, there's also, you know, better specs in the same, you know, kind of price range. So I could convert this tractor over to two group 31 batteries, gain an extra, let's say 200 amps 
and it really doesn't cost anything more. So essentially we'll have twice as many amps, but that doesn't really matter because, I mean, the, the starter only pulls so many amps. It doesn't really matter what kind of battery is behind it. The catch, though, is that we're going to have to probably make some larger battery cables because the battery cable that's here is only rated for 950 amps. And now we basically have twice that capacity available. Now, like I said, the starter only pulls so many amps, so if you want to get technical about it, you don't really have to have a bigger battery cable, but in case there's a short circuit somewhere in this system right here, we're going to, you know, there's a chance we get caught, you know, caught short with a smaller cable. So in order to accommodate two 12 volt batteries, I think we're going to have to start over with the cables, you know, basically just start that over from scratch. Now the other thing we could do is just go to one 12 volt battery. You know, you figure in 1960, what, seven, when this tractor was built, batteries weren't anything like what they are today. And there's probably a pretty good chance that one 12 volt battery, like one group 31 battery, would start this tractor just fine. But I'm gonna go to the store, see what I, see what I come up with, and uh, we'll make a decision from there. Okay, before I do that, I want to opine for a minute about batteries, because I got a lot of things to say about these things. They're like the bane of my existence. Lots of tribalism involved with batteries. Everybody has their favorite color, creed, brand, whatever. You know, some guys are Interstate, Optima, Motorcraft, AC Delco. It doesn't really matter. As far as I know, there are only three manufacturers of batteries in North America. Exide, Decca, and Johnson Controls. And Johnson Controls is by far the biggest one. So, no matter what battery you buy, no matter what it says on the side of it, it's going to be made by one of those three companies, at least here in North America. And these three batteries right here are Farm and Fleet batteries. They are made by East Penn Manufacturing, a.k.a. DECA. Now, here are three more Farm and Fleet batteries. I bet if I scrounged around, I could probably come up with at least two more. So I've got at least eight Farm and Fleet batteries on the premises. Now, I've had a lot of guys tell me in the comments about how great these Farm and Fleet batteries are. Uh, I don't agree. If you're not familiar with Farm and Fleet, Farm and Fleet's kind of a farm supply store that we have here in the Midwest. I think they're based out of Wisconsin, but they're all over Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois. Anyway, their batteries are made by DECA, and I've just had terrible luck with them. Any one that I've bought in the last 10 years has been pretty much junk out of the box. A lot of times they won't meet the CCA specs right from the get-go, and they just won't survive. They won't last more than a couple years. Now, there are different tiers of Farm and Fleet batteries. The more you pay, obviously, the better battery that you get. The problem is, like these commercial batteries, which are what, what are kind of, kind of targeted towards the tractors and trucks and stuff, they only have this gold series. Now, East Penn also makes batteries for Napa. They're, they look exactly the same. A lot of times they even have the same part number. But I've installed lots of Napa batteries and never had an issue. So I don't know if we're just getting bum batteries where we are or I'm doing something wrong, but I don't recommend Farm and Fleet batteries. Well, $243 later, I've got two new batteries. These are Group 31 stud top batteries, standard truck batteries. I took the battery boxes along, made sure they were going to fit. Everything looks good. We are going to have to basically start over with our cables, though. At a minimum, we need new ends and one new ground cable, but I think we're probably going to do all new cables because, like I said, we're going to have a lot more jam with these two 12 volt batteries in parallel. And these are CarQuest batteries. As far as I know, they're made by Johnson Controls. I've had pretty good luck with these. Now, JC Smith was telling me somewhere over by him that the truck dealership will sell these Group 31 batteries for like 75 bucks. I've never seen anything quite like that around here. The international dealership, about once a year, they'll run a special where they, they sell these batteries for about $90 a piece, but I've never seen anything like 75 bucks. That would be awesome. It looks like the original battery cables were all two gauge. That's two American wire gauge. And they're not really in too bad a condition. So I think what we're going to do, we'll take this old crossover cable from one battery to the other. We'll cut it right in half and we'll use that for our two grounds. And then we'll make a new crossover using some new red two gauge wire to go from battery to battery. And we'll crimp all of those with these 3 8 lugs here, or terminals, whatever you want to call them. 
And then for the second battery to the starter, we'll make a new cable out of some 2 aught, you know, super heavy duty cable. And that'll give us lots of carrying, current carrying capacity up there to the starter. And to do that, we're going to use a new toy. This is a clutch hydraulic terminal crimping tool. This is the main thing of it right here. So it's got this little hydraulic jack basically built into it. Comes with a variety of dies that are supposed to crimp this nice hex shape onto whatever terminal you want. Now, I bought this thing from Northern Tool for $30. I have no idea how they can make something like this for 30 bucks. Ship it to the United States and then sell it and make a profit. That just, that's insane to me. There's so many parts to this thing. Anyway, if you're not familiar with Northern Tool, it's kind of like Harbor Freight, but for people who are too lazy to drive to a store. And they have a, you know, they used to have an old catalog. Now it's all mostly done online. I think they do have some brick and mortar stores, but there's not one anywhere near me. Anyway, we're going to try this guy out. It's supposed to go up to, what, 120 square millimeters. So I have no idea what that is in American wire gauge. I think it's like 6 aught or something. It's way, way bigger than what I would need. Okay, it's my first go around. So I started with the 35 die, the 35 square millimeter, and I didn't feel like it was tight enough, so I went down to the 25. I think that might have been a mistake, because now I'm getting this, this flash here on the sides. So 35 might be the way to go. You know, it's, the tool certainly isn't calibrated or anything like that. I read some other reviews and watched some other videos, and guys were saying just, just kind of have to try the dies out and see which one, which one fits the best for your application. All right, here we go. So we turn this thing to to rock and roll here. And I gotta say it's kind of awkward. Probably the best thing to do would be to pre-tension the terminal. So get a little tension on the terminal and then stick the wire in. Because I mean you really need three hands to do this, kind of like any crimping tool. So I'm back to the 35 millimeter square die. Let's see how she goes here. Okay, that's it. I don't know. Feels pretty good, really. So that's the crimp you get. Let me try something else here. So this is the for real crimping tool for this style of terminal. This is a stake on, which is a trademark of Thomas and Betts, I believe. So let's try that real quick. Stick that in there. So same problem, you need three hands. Oh, okay. So that's the crimp you get with the, the for real tool versus the crimp you get with the hydraulic tool. I don't know, this thing feels pretty solid. And I feel like it's cleaner, especially on larger terminals. That's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot better. The problem with this style of crimp is it kinda, kinda flares out, makes a flat, kind of a flat crimp. I don't know. Plus, I'll have to price this tool, but I bet you if you had to buy one of these, it's probably close to 400 bucks. Well, it finally occurred to me that I don't need a third hand because I have a vise. Now, rookie mistake, got a 
flip this other die around. There we go. Now the jaws are even. Alright, let's try it on some bigger cable. This is 2 aught, 2 slash 0. That's what we call it here in the United States. I don't know what the actual for real name for it is. Anyway, I'm going to go from the 35 die to 70. And it's on the floor. So I think based on the length of the terminal, we might have to crimp this one twice. So we'll crimp it at the back and then move it, kind of move it forward. I don't know fellas, I'm starting to like it. I mean 30 bucks, 30 bucks for this thing. The for real, like stake on tool for this size wire is $600. Okay, I think we got all of our cables made up. So here's our two grounds. This one here is gonna go between the two batteries and then this big mama is gonna go from the batteries to the starter. Now I wasn't thinking, I could have made this crossover piece here out of this old cable that ran from the battery to the starter. Somehow I totally spaced out on that. So I would not have had to use new cable for this, but whatever. I had it, so that's what I did. I'll throw that other piece in my collection and we'll use it for some other little short piece that we need to make someday in the future. Anyway, let's put this thing together. Come on, guy. First time putting a bolt in. There we
This other big cable goes to the preheater for the manifold. So you can start the freaking thing in the winter. I can't believe Oliver thought this was a good idea. You know what's crazy about this? Once you take this latch loose, there's nothing holding the battery in there other than the cables. The whole thing just goes right out on the ground. Ask me how I know. I'll tell you what, wrestling these 2 watt cables around is no fun. Even the 2 gauge cables are no fun. I don't know how anybody gets them deals with those bigger cables like three on they make four on battery cable if you want to buy it I don't think I've ever seen anything bigger than two on they make these special nuts for these group 31 batteries I think they're they're tinned copper and they have a little cap on the top you can use a regular nut I suppose if you wanted to but these are these are better for keeping out the green crusties Now when you're dealing with two batteries in parallel, you always want to hook up both positives on both batteries and then hook up both negatives on both batteries. Because that way if you, uh, you know, touch something with your wrench on the negative side, you're not going to have any arcing and sparking. Now of course there's always exceptions to that rule and every mechanic's got a collection of wrenches and sockets that are partially melted from shorting the positive to the frame or to some other big ground. Anyway, I think we're done super happy with the way that lays but throw the covers back on and we should be ready to try this out I got a quick coupler here for the hydraulics that's leaking pretty badly. I wonder if we can fix that or at least try to. I don't know what these are, Pioneer or something.
Well, I replaced the O-ring, but I don't see a problem with the old O-ring, so that's probably not going to fix the problem. In fact, I think it's still leaking right now. Uh, most likely, what we'll have to do is just replace this whole coupling. They're not that expensive, so I'll get it out there and get a new one, but that'll be a project for another day. All right, guys. I think we're going to call this a win and quit while we're ahead. I do believe that one of these big batteries would be good enough to start this tractor, but, you know, more battery, more better. And these, these pre-combustion Waukesha engines are terribly hard starting. And there's something wrong with this tractor still. Uh, I'll link to another video I did about the hard starting that was uh, related to the metering valve in the injection pump there. And that issue is not resolved. Uh, there's something else going on with this injection pump. It doesn't, it doesn't work quite right. The governor sticks or the metering valve sticks or something. So, you know, when you get it started up, if you can get it started, it, it goes right up to kind of high idle, like 15, 16, sometimes even 1800 RPM. And it stays there for a long time, regardless of where you put the throttle. So something is sticking in there, and it's, it makes it pretty scary to run. And then when you first start it up, the governor doesn't seem to react quite right. The tractor doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have any power. It kind of falls on its face. And then you run it for a little bit, and it straightens right out. So... The injection pump's going to have to come off, and we're going to have to do some work to that. I already bought a, a rebuild kit for it and the one-piece governor weight basket. I just haven't had time to get, get that done. Uh, also, there's lots of oil leaks going on. I think our O-ring did help here on this coupler, but I probably still need to replace that whole thing. So you see i got a little bit of a puddle of oil right here, but nothing like what we used to have. So I've got to address that. Then the transmission's leaking pretty bad see a big spot there uh, something's also leaking out of the PTO area not sure what's going on there and then I got a problem with the tires and the tubes uh, the tubes must be bad inside the tires you can see fluid you know the calcium chloride or whatever fluid actually leaking out of the cracks in the tires and the tires themselves are basically shot but I cannot afford to put new tires on it right now these tires are quite expensive so we're gonna have to let that ride also I noticed that the hubs here if you see it there the hubs are adjustable on the axles so you can set you know different track widths and it looks like the hubs are are walking out so we'll have to loosen up the big u-bolts in there and try to shove those hubs back in a little bit uh, the other side's doing it too but not quite as badly now as far as the crimper is concerned I think this thing's a winner I mean, for 30 bucks, how could you possibly go wrong? So I'm sure I'll get some comments from some pedantic viewers, you know, telling me I'm using it wrong. And they're probably right. But, you know, the thing comes with no instructions. And I watched a few other videos and it seemed to be kind of all over the place as far as, you know, how far to crimp it and what die to use. So I'm saying just do whatever works. You know, and I've got other crimping tools. So the, the stake on crimping tool here is a little easier to use. You know, it's certainly faster and more convenient but crazy expensive so I have this thing too which is like a, a hammer style crimping tool and you can see this battery cable was on the tractor and it was crimped I'm sure with a, a tool just like this so it works but it makes this kind of weird triangular shape crimp it has to just by the way the tool is built so you see right there I'm, I'm certain that that's how that that lug was crimped. Same with this end. So it works, but you see it makes that kind of weird, you know, triangular shape. So, you know, these are nice if you need to do a field repair or something, you just want to throw it in your toolbox and, and take it out with you, get you out of a jam. But it's not nearly as nice as these two tools. So my two cents about battery cables is that the best quality and most cost-effective cables are these pre-made units like this. I can't buy these parts and put these cables together for cheaper than what I can buy them. And the quality is better. You know, they, these are cast right onto the, to the wire. You don't have any, anything to worry about as far as corrosion goes. That's the best. So second best would be to use a, a for real tool like this. You know, do it right, crimp the thing up, use your heat shrink. That's going to last just as long as his pre-made ones, as long as you do it right. I guess 
After that would be this thing, the hammer lock style. You know, that works, but it's a little bit kind of, I don't know. It's not as good as these. Let's just put it that way. And then the worst case scenario would be to use these things, these cheesy repair lugs. These things are terrible. Th they'll work all right on tractors and equipment and stuff that, you know, doesn't get used on the road, but do not use these on your car or a truck or anything that's going to see salt. I've fixed a lot of no start problems that were related to these terrible repair lug things. Uh, these are junk. Now, all that being said, most good auto parts stores will make battery cables for you. They sell bulk cable, they sell the terminal ends, they sell the heat shrink. If you buy that stuff from them, tell them what length you need. Usually they'll crimp them up for you. It doesn't cost you anything extra. I know my local auto parts store does that all the time. And <laughs> honestly, other than convenience, there's really no reason for me to own all these tools. I can easily get that done at my auto parts store. Now, maybe that's different in other parts of the world, but around here, no problem. Go in, tell them what you need, show them the old one or whatever if you have it, and they'll take care of you. All right, guys, I'm not much of a reviewer of tools, and I'm, you know, I don't feel like tearing it apart or whatever, seeing what it's all about. All I know is it worked, and I don't see why it won't keep working. Comes with a rebuild kit for the hydraulic cylinder, so I guess if that thing starts spewing everywhere, you can fix it up. So obviously, if you need to make, you know, mill spec, UL certified crimps, you're not shopping in the Northern Tool catalog. But for, you know, regular people like me, I think this is a good option. So I've seen them on eBay. You know, I'm sure, no doubt, made in the same Chinese factory. But this is the one I bought. I'll put a link to the Northern Tool thing. I don't know if the price has changed or whatever. But if you want to check it out, I think it's worth owning. All right, guys. I think that's it. Not much of a video, I guess. But I thought it was interesting, so I'll probably go ahead and post it and we'll figure out something to do for the next time. Uh, I'm not sure what that's going to be. Uh, I've been struggling, really struggling for the last, I don't know, probably about three weeks now. Uh, we finally sold our other house. So I've been here in the house slash shop for, uh, since the 4th of July. So what's that? Seven, eight months now. And we just finally were able to sell our other house, which is two hours away. So I've been paying for two houses and maintaining two houses, you know, mowing the grass and raking the leaves and cleaning the gutters and all that stuff two hours away. And then we finally got an offer and I had to make a bunch of repairs to the house, including replacing uh, part of the roof, which we knew we had to do, but I wasn't expecting to do it in February. And you can imagine what, you know, roofing repairs are like in February in Northern Illinois. It's not, not a whole lot of fun, but we, we had a little break in the weather, got it done. Uh, the closing was yesterday, so yeah, words cannot express how relieved I am that that is done. So I'm hoping we can get, kind of get cracking up here and get the shop put together and, and start doing some work and making some money. Uh, there's a lot of things I need to do. The lighting in here is terrible, as you guys keep pointing out to me. Uh, the insulation isn't the greatest. It's insulated, but there's no like wind barrier, and it blows here all the time. The wind never stops. So maybe do something about that. Uh, but the weather's starting to come around, so that'll probably be more of a fall project. I got to fix some leaks in the siding and the roof, and just otherwise get the stuff organized and try to bang out some more content for the YouTube channel because I have been uh, pretty much focused on that house for the last. I don't know, three weeks or so. So you guys have, have been taking a back seat to that. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Yeah, maybe we should do something with this little guy. Only four months tell power to her. Don't think we're going to make it.
the hydraulics on this Oliver are just painfully slow, but it sure beats shoveling. <laughs> 